Good evening. Does it matter that presidential candidates tell the truth? If it does, then Fianna Foyle has a problem. Either Brian Lenehan wasn't telling the truth last May, or he's not telling the truth now. Well, I want to say that I'm absolutely certain on mature recollection at this stage that I did not ring President Hillary, and I want to put my reputation on the line in that respect. The 1990 Irish presidential election was unlike any other political campaign in the history of the Irish state. I was in Orson when those phone calls came through, and I know how many there were. I don't know who they were from, in any way. It was controversial, dramatic, and unique for a number of reasons. After denying all week that he phoned the president to try to stop him dissolving the Doyle in 1982, Brian Lenehan is now haunted by the publication today of a taped interview in which he says he did phone the president and so did Charles Hawhey. Yeah, I believe there were eight phone calls made. Well, there were eight, two or three. Well, there were two or three, sir. And uh, did any of the phone calls get through to the president's face? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I got through to him. I remember talking to him. In fact, looking back on it, it was a mistake. It saw Mary Robinson, the supposed liberal outsider, elected as the first ever female president of Ireland, ending Fianna Fáil's tight grip over the office and it effectively ended the political career of Brian Lennon Sr., as the then Thonishta almost brought down the government. Not for an instant did it occur to him that a student would break with protocol in that way and, and drop him in it. The whole thing was, uh, was, was planned by, by Fine Gael and by Duffy. The women of Ireland, Manona Heron, who instead of rocking the cradle, rocked the system. <laughs> Overnight, Mary Robinson leapfrogged beyond him. I can't think of a bigger upset in Irish politics before or since. In retrospect, people think, oh, it's obvious Mary Robinson was going to win, but it wasn't. It was absolutely unthinkable. It was unethical. He felt deceived. But first, how did it all begin? You're unbelievable. Before 1990, the office of the President of Ireland had attracted little attention and was seen more or less as a figurehead position. In fact, by the end of Patrick Hillary's second term in office, there hadn't been a presidential election put to a public vote for 17 years. In September of 1990, a UCD postgraduate student named Jim Duffy, who was writing a thesis on the presidency, had a series of articles published in the Irish Times. One of his articles questioned if a full presidential election was even necessary to decide the next incumbent of the office. He may not have realised it at the time, but Duffy was almost single-handedly about to rejuvenate public interest in Irish presidential elections, and he was briefly about to become the most famous postgraduate student in Ireland. Both Fine Gael and Labour were determined to put forward candidates to challenge what many people saw as the mere formality of Fianna Fáil's Brian Lennon taking over the presidency. As Labour's advisor on the Robinson campaign in 1990, Fergus Finlay explains. The leader of the Labour Party at the time, Dick Spring, believed very strongly that the office should be contested. He was becoming concerned, first of all, that the office had ceased to have any meaning in the eyes of the people, uh, and secondly, that it was likely this time to be used as a way of crowning or a coronation for Brian Lenehan, um, who was just going to be assumed into office, um, and he was determined to try and stop that if he could and force some kind of an election. The then Tornister, Brian Lennon, was one of the most popular and likeable politicians in the country. Seen as something of a lovable rogue, his popularity had been further boosted by the wave of sympathy he received following a life-threatening liver transplant the previous year. Historian Michael Laffin recalls the feeling before the campaign began. It was expected, with quite a degree of confidence, that Brian Lenehan would romp home without much difficulty. Fine Gael were expected to run either Garrett Fitzgerald or Peter Barry as their candidate. Labour, however, were proposing to change the role of the presidency somewhat and do away with the sleepy president stereotype that had gone before. They wanted former party member and senator, the constitutional lawyer, Mary Robinson, to run. Finley describes how Labour arrived at Robinson as their preferred candidate. It gradually began to emerge that there really was only one person who could fill the job description that we had in mind, who could make the office meaningful again, radicalise it within its limits, um, uh, and make the office stand for something. Uh, and that person was Mary Robinson. Robinson, though, would only agree to run as an independent candidate nominated by Labour and the Workers' Party. Crucially, this allowed her to appeal to those of all parties and none. However, journalist John Waters, who covered the campaign for the Irish Times in 1990, explains why Robinson's proposed candidacy was something of a surprise. Mary Robinson was a, a, an odd character. Uh, I mean, she was hugely respected uh, as a lawyer um, uh, and as an activist. You know, she'd been involved in lots of different kind of feminist causes and... and progressive causes and so on, and, and was eminent, uh, would be the word you'd use. But there wasn't a huge affection for her, you know, and I don't mean that disparagingly, it's just she wasn't the kind of personality that 
provoked affection in the way that Lenahan, for example, did. In fact, quite the opposite. She, she kind of was the kind of person that people would admire without necessarily loving. Mary Robinson was best known for her campaigning on a range of liberal issues, such as women's rights and homosexuality, throughout the 70s and 80s. But she didn't seem to appeal to the broad electorate. I think it was probably 78 or 9. Um, she stood for election in Dublin West, and the slogan that was used consistently against her was, if you want a knacker for a neighbour, vote Robinson. Mary Robinson's campaign manager in 1990, Bride Rosney, explains that a lack of profile was one of the biggest obstacles they faced. I remember she was nominated in the end of April, beginning of May. It was publicly announced. And I remember in June ringing close friends in Tralee. And I said, listen, we want to set up a meeting for Mary Robinson to... And the answer was, Mary who? Once Robinson's candidacy was announced, she was contacted by television producer Owen Harris. He suggested she undergo something of an image transformation to broaden her appeal. Her problem is, I said to her, I got a laugh from her, I said, your problem is you've got too intelligent and that you're going to start lecturing and finger-wagging at the Irish people and they hate finger-wagging lectures. So I said, you have to stop the law library lecturing shite and start actually, you know, become the girl from Ballina, the girl from the west of Ireland who has a story, a narrative of the Irish people which says, time to modernise Ireland and I'm the symbol of it. Robinson not only successfully changed her public image and people's perception of her, but she began her campaign a full four months before any other candidate. This gave her time to travel the length of the country and speak with the electorate, as Rosney explains. It was a very long campaign, it was six months. Normally, before that, presidential campaigns had been about a month. But it was really a campaign in two halves. The first half, she went around the country and asked people what they wanted. And the second half, she went around the country and told them what they'd get. And it was really interesting, and it's probably an Irishism. The phrase that kept coming up during the first half was, we want somebody who will do us proud. That phrase, do us proud. Journalist John Waters describes the momentum that was beginning to build in the Robinson campaign by late August of 1990. Right through that year, she was all over the country, very quietly, no fuss, no reportage about it. People were sort of looking at this woman and thinking, wouldn't it be grand if she was the president? Wouldn't it be a good thing for us, for our kids, for the kind of, yeah, you change. And people were saying, oh yeah, let's, yeah, let's go for that, quietly. Fine Gael, on the other hand, appeared to be struggling to secure their candidate. Having already promised that they would contest the election, leader of Fine Gael in 1990, Alan Jukes, explains the difficult position he found himself in. There were a lot of people in the party who felt that either Gareth Fitzgerald, a former Taoiseach, uh, or Peter Barry, a former foreign minister, uh, should be the candidates. Uh, personally, I, I knew, having talked to each of them, they weren't interested in the office. They didn't want to be president, they didn't want to be persuaded to be president, and frankly, we wasted a lot of time in Fine Gael, hoping, uh, or with various people hoping, that one or the other of those two uh, would be the candidate. And then the suggestion came that perhaps uh, we should look for a Northern Ireland-based candidate. Uh, and Austin Curry was a person who commanded a great deal of respect here. I was uh, against the idea. The first problem was that I um, had entered into Southern politics only the previous year. Austin Curry was a former minister in the Northern government. Although well respected, he didn't have a huge standing in Southern politics, and he had already publicly ruled himself out of running for the presidency. Despite later accepting Fine Gael's nomination, Curry explains that he never really felt confident of victory. I'd been elected in uh, Dublin West in, um, in 89, and the, this election was coming up in 90. Uh, and uh, I felt myself, and it certainly felt by one of my strong supporters, uh, that the attitude of people would be, well, uh, you know, what, what is this fellow thinking about to that? You know, he's less than one year into politics in the, in the, in the state, and now he, he wants to be president. The fact, I think, that we were rather late choosing him told a bit against him, both in the general public uh, and in the party. Uh, I'd have to say there was less than that wholehearted commitment in the party to campaigning for the presidential election. Fergus Finlay describes the reaction on the Robinson campaign to Curry's nomination. Now I knew Austin Curry very well and I liked him. Uh, he'd been the very first Minister for Children in Ireland and had done a good job. 
but I didn't regard him as remotely electable against the other two. I thought it was a complete disaster uh, for Fine Gael to nominate him. Crucially though, Curry's entry meant it would be a three-horse race, and that second preference vote transfers would also count on polling day in November. It wasn't until the middle of September that Fianna Fáil confirmed Brian Lennon as their candidate. Planning to run a short campaign, their confidence seemed well-founded, with bookmakers Paddy Power installing Lennon as the 1-4 to four on favourite to win. Lennon's campaign manager in 1990, Bertie Ahern, describes the feeling in the Fianna Fáil party at the outset of the campaign. Our expectation was that this w would not be too difficult. Uh, we were a mile ahead in the polls. Um, so even allowing for a, a substantial slippage um, in a normal campaign, uh, there was only going to be one winner, and that's the way it looked at the end of September. With Lennon beginning with such a commanding lead, his opponents went on the offensive, casting doubt over his ability to execute one of the key responsibilities of the presidency, remaining independent from government. Particularly, as Austin Curry explains, from Lennon's friend and political ally of 30 years, the Taoiseach, Charles Hawley. It was obvious to me uh, that uh, from their previous experience and um, previous cooperation uh, that, uh, that Brian Lennon would be paying a lot of attention to the views of uh, Charlie Hockey uh, and Charlie Hockey need to be watched very carefully. At his opening press conference to launch his campaign, Austin Curry had raised the issue of presidential independence from government. Citing an article published in the Irish Times, written by UCD student Jim Duffy, the article claimed that Lennon had sought to influence the independence of President Hillary during an incident eight years previously, when Garrett Fitzgerald's government collapsed in February of 1982. The accusation, along with Duffy's article, had been largely ignored. That was until, on Monday the 22nd of October, when Brian Lennon was due to appear on RTE Television's live political discussion show, Questions and Answers. In a last-minute change to the lineup. Fianna Gael's Jim Mitchell, who was Austin Curry's campaign manager in 1990, was replaced on the panel by Garrett Fitzgerald, a switch that set alarm bells ringing for Bertie Ahern. It came back to me very quickly that uh, um, Jim Mitchell was about to place. Uh, he, was, he wasn't on any other duties. So um, uh, we did reckon that night uh, that the Fianna Gael were up to something. On the programme, Garrett Fitzgerald raised the issue of presidential independence and the grey area in the constitution that could potentially allow a president to refuse to grant a dual dissolution. Again, raising the accusation that Brian Lennon had phoned President Hillary in 1982 to try and convince him to do just that, after confidence had been lost in Fitzgerald's government. If President Hillary had refused the dual dissolution, it could potentially have allowed Fianna Fáil to form a government without a general election. Gareth Fitzgerald, this, the discretionary yeah. powers that the president has or the indecision in the constitution on the, that the question. The point I want to make earlier, you see, in the last four elections, three of them have involved uh, difficulties, crises, <coughs> problems that involved actually or potentially the president. In 1982, it was, uh, the question came up of whether I would get a dissolution or not. And uh, there were, you'd recall, Brian, a whole series of phone calls to Orson Uthron seeking to put pressure on the president to refuse me a dissolution so that it would go back to the door when there was no clear majority for anybody else. That kind of pressure was, I think, um, um, improper and undesirable in those circumstances. That option is there. It has never been exercised by an Irish president Why the fact of phone calls to try and force them to exercise it? That's fictional, Garrett. It's not fictional. It's Excuse me. I was in Orson Uthron when those phone calls came through no, and I know no, how many there Garrett, were. Garrett, I don't know who they were from in any way. <laughs> And I want, to, I want to get this on to... They were from ministers in the government. When I, I, I the want to get this on to... Who wants to be in government? the opposition. I want to... I want to... I think it's long no, as... Sorry, Mr. Brian Chairman, Mr. Brian Mr. Chairman... Mr. Chairman... Nor interfering, if Mr. Chairman, right. I, I want to put this on a, on a proper level. The fact of the matter is that it, it's very important that the President preserves this discretion that is written into the Constitution. I can assure the public out there listening that I will be such a president and that my record of loyalty and understanding of the Constitution over 33 years is one that I will carry into the presidency. The debate moved on until presenter John Bowman opened the floor to questions from the audience. Brian Murphy, a Fine Gael plant in the audience, pressed Lennon again about the alleged phone calls in 1982. Have your point. Yes. Man in the second row here. Not by the Labour Party. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Supported by Mr. Le Mr. Lennon yeah. has said here this evening that we don't want a president meddling in party politics I want to ask Mr Lenehan directly about the events of February 1982. Uh, he commented on it, but I want a, a straight answer. Uh, did he make a phone call or phone calls 
to Aras and Ultron in that period in February 1982 uh, when the then Taoiseach, Dr Gareth Fitzgerald, was seeking a dissolution of the Dáil? No, I didn't at all. That, ne that never happened. And I, want to, I want to assure you that it never happened. It seems to me that eight phone calls were made by people who imitated the voices of leaders of the opposition extremely skilled. <laughs> Historian Michael Laffin explains why this relatively small issue eight years previously, which had ultimately been unsuccessful anyway, was something that Brian Lennon was keen to distance himself from. The second Hawke government that lasted only about eight, nine, ten months in 1982 was in every way a disaster, uh, marked by uh, scandal, uh, marked by humiliating collapse at the end, uh, and um, marked above all by what Conor Cruz O'Brien called the Gubu affair, when uh, the most wanted criminal in the country, a murderer, uh, was holed up in the house, the flat, of the Attorney General. Eight years on, in 1990, that was uh, a very, very unpleasant memory indeed. Uh, and the last thing that a Fianna Fáil candidate like Brian Lenham would have wanted would be, would be to be associated with that particular embarrassing uh, incident. Watching questions and answers that night was the UCD student Jim Duffy. In researching his postgraduate thesis on the presidency, Duffy had conducted an interview with Brian Lennon in May of 1990. The interview had formed the basis of one of Duffy's articles published in the Irish Times that September. However, Lennon was now denying what he had said about the 1982 phone calls in his interview to Duffy. Crucially though, Duffy had taped his interview with Lennon. The next day, Duffy contacted Professor Michael Laffin, then the head of UCD's history department, to seek his advice. He said, uh, I have got some information about a prominent public figure. Uh, and I don't know whether I should reveal it or not. So immediately I became wary, uh, uneasy, uh, and I said, well, under what circumstances did you get that information? And he said that he had interviewed the person concerned, whom he didn't name. He had interviewed that person uh, and uh, was told something that was important. And immediately I said, if that interview took place under terms of confidentiality, then you cannot make it public. I got the impression that Jim Duffy didn't like what I said, and that was the end of it, as far as I was concerned, and didn't think about it until the next day, when there were articles in the Irish Times about Brian Lenehan, uh, rumours uh, about an attempt to persuade the President Hillary to dissolve the oil, and Brian Lenehan contradicting himself. So then I realised, mm, this is, after all, rather interesting, rather important, much more important than I had imagined when I had simply told him, don't do it. And then, in the course of that day, there were stories about Fianna Foyle supporters hunting UCD, hunting Belfield, try, trying to track down Jim Duffy and failing to find him. Duffy went against the advice he received from Laffin and other UCD academics and played his tape to the Irish Times political editor, Dick Walsh. The next day, the Irish Times ran the story on its front page, claiming to have evidence that Lenhan did make the phone call he was now denying. The revelation sent Fianna Fáil into a panic. They were tipped off about a student interview. In May of 1990, when Duffy had conducted his interview, Lennon had been recovering from a follow-on surgery related to his liver transplant the year previous. The strong medication he was taking at that time meant he had no memory of exactly what he had said to Duffy. Bertie Ahern claims that Lennon couldn't even recall giving Duffy an interview in the first place. I had asked him, um, uh, you know, did he know anything about this? Did he know anything about his student? And he had no recollection whatever. Um, I think what he said to me was that he'd given loads of interviews to loads of students over loads of periods and whenever the Duffy name came into it, I'm not sure when the Duffy name came into it, but he had no recollection of, 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 of Duffy. It, it was clear then that this was what had been set up by, by Fine Gael um, and, and, and of course then uh, linked into the Irish Times. The pressure mounted for the Irish Times to make public their evidence of Lenhan's alleged phone call. However, rather than simply run the exclusive in their own paper, they held a press conference in Dublin's Westbury Hotel, where Jim Duffy himself played his taped interview with Lennon to a packed room of the country's assembled media. They listened as Lennon's own voice contradicted his statements of the previous days. Uh, well, you made a phone call. Why did you? Yeah, Silver, the Special Barrel And uh, Mr. Hoy. Yeah, that's right. And uh, did any of the phone calls get through to the President's Street? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I got through to him at the top there. And uh, he wanted to, he wanted to lay off the lot. There was no doubt about his mind about his body. In fact, looking back on it, it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Paddy Henry would be very uh, sort of strict and conventional that way. You know, he would want to start breaking you. 
I'm sorry, man. Very conscious man. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the wound. Uh, the break the well because Charlie was good poor. And there is an argument, as you know, under that. Mm-hmm. We'll have to improve the phraseology of that. Definitely. Duffy's tape had Lenehan admitting to not just making a phone call, but that he had even gotten through and spoken with President Hillary. In his memoir, Brian Lenehan claims that Jim Duffy stopped the tape just before Lenehan goes on to confirm with the student that the conversation was off the record. Irish Times journalist in 1990, John Waters, explains that the problem for Lenehan, as with so many political scandals, was not the initial wrongdoing, but the attempt to cover it up. The, the sting of the, the, the assault on Lenehan was the contradiction between what he had said to Duffy and what he said in questions and answers. It wasn't the calling of the artist, that was kind of academic. It was the idea that in one or other situation he had told a lie. Amazingly, Brian Lennon was not even aware of the events that were unfolding at Duffy's press conference. He was canvassing voters in a shopping centre in Donahmead when RT reporter Brendan O'Brien confronted the confused Lennon seeking his response to the playing of Duffy's tape. Hello girls, Mr Lenahan, I'm sure you'd like an opportunity to apply to the latest developments in the telephone call business. The Irish Times today revealed the contents of the tape in which it has you admitting that you made the phone call directly to President Hillary. I never spoke to President Hillary on that occasion or on any other occasion with regard to a constitutional matter. This is a transcript of the tape here. It's a, the question is... I'm only interested in what you... I spoke to. Uh, did I or did I not ring or speak to President Hillary on the night in question? I did not ring him nor did I speak to him, and I have confirmed that that is the correct position, and that what appeared on any other tape is incorrect. That is the position. I am arranging a meeting with the President tomorrow, and the position is that I neither rang him nor talked to him. They all heard position. your voice on the tape, though. That's the difficulty. <laughs> the tape was played to the press, you see. But, uh, I, I, know I did not speak to Dr. Hillary on the occasion. Do you understand plain English? Word quickly got to Lennon's campaign team about Duffy's tape. Frantically, they decided it would be best to try and take control of the breaking story by going on RTE Television 6-1 News, where Lennon was interviewed live on air by presenter Sean Dignan. Yeah, we tried to unravel this. Do you accept, and let me say this to you, everyone who has heard this taped interview says, yes, that is Brian Lennon. Do you accept that that's you, Brian Lennon, speaking to Jim Duffy on that tape? Sean, this was a, a discussion between myself and a research student in the politics faculty in UCD. I obliged him by giving him some background on various presidencies. It was a casual discussion. I appreciate I, I that. Must, I must have it been... It was mis- taped and you were aware that it was being taped. But Sean, I am saying here I must be mistaken on that occasion. And my clear recollection of the situation is that I can did I, not speak to President Hillary can, on that occasion. Can, can, I, can I put it to you this way? Could I help you? Prop- is it... Are you... Either you didn't tell the truth to the nation or you didn't tell the truth to Jim Duffy. Are you saying that you didn't tell the truth to Jim Duffy? Is that what you're saying? I I must have been mistaken in what I said. The TV interview was a disaster for Lennon. As Dogden recalls, it is remembered most strikingly for Lennon repeatedly turning away from him, looking directly into the camera and uttering a phrase that would later become a synonym in Irish culture for a questionable version of events. It was quite extraordinary. The only thing he did was uh, famously or rather perhaps infamously, to turn into camera away from me on at least two occasions to say that, quote, on mature reflection, unquote, he he could say definitely that he didn't telephone uh, the president and that he was asking the Irish people to trust him on that. It was a very hard line, if not an impossible line to sell. I want to say that I'm absolutely certain on mature recollection at this stage that I did not ring President Hillary, and I want to put my reputation on the line in that respect. Lennon had a reputation for usually being smooth when it came to TV appearances, but his performance that night made viewers uneasy. Lennon's sister and Minister for the Environment in 1990, Mary O'Rourke, explains that PJ Mara had advised Lennon to speak straight to camera and address the nation directly. PJ Mara, who was our PR guru, taught him to look straight into the camera, which he did. You know that famous scene. I always thought it was just rotten PR. To a recollection um, interview went, went down badly. It went down, Brian knew it wasn't a good interview. He looked straight in camera. John Dignan uh, kept quizzing him on it. Um, and it, 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 it wasn't something any of us were happy with, uh, and not least Brian. Um, if, if, if we had have, uh, what we should have done was not did anything that evening. Uh, let, let, let the uh, articles be written, let the newspapers come out. Um, checked with some of the people who were there at the time, 
got it absolutely clear, you know, from the people that were there in, in 82, what the hell did happen and, and why they did it, and then just put out one statement. You have implicated the Taoiseach in this, in, the, in, in this, in this, Sean. It's wider than just the presidency. Sean. You've now got the government in problems. Sean. Don't you think in those circumstances that you perhaps at, should step at down? At the particular time we were in opposition, I'm not making any point of that. What I'm concerned about is this. I have a long reputation of being honest in public life. The people out there know that. What I'm saying is this, very specifically, that I did not ring President Hillary on that night. I did not speak to him on that night or on any other night. And I remember distinctly that at the very end, I put my hand out to ask him, stay where you are, as it were. He took the signal because I had to introduce the next news item. That took a few seconds to do. And then I was able to turn around and uh, thank him, take his hand, shake it. And he stood up. I had to remain seated. And I always remember he looked down at me and he shook his head like that. And he and I knew that it was a total unmitigated disaster for him, virtually on the eve of polling. Almost immediately, the retired Fianna Fáil minister, Sylvester Barrett, came out to claim sole and complete responsibility for the Irish phone calls, absolving his old friend, Brian Lennon. I rang Aris and Utra. Brian Linehan did not ring Aris and Utra. Charles Hawhey did not ring Aris and Utra. I was the person who rang Aris and Utra. But I did not speak to Dr. Hillary because Dr. Hillary was not available to take the call. But few people believed Barrett's convenient version of history. Fine Gael put down a motion of no confidence in the government, claiming the Tornista had misled the public. But Fine Gael leader in 1990, Alan Dukes, explains that the desired effect was to oust Hawhey, not Lennon. And it added another block to the edifice of, uh, of, of, of opposition of um, suspicion of Charles Hawhey that had been developing over over uh, quite a long time, so that politically uh, it was an absolute no-brainer that uh, you know uh, a motion of no confidence in the government had to be proposed. The Robinson campaign stayed away from the scandal, hoping it would help to create a presidential image around her. Despite the whole affair seeming to have been orchestrated, at least in part by Fine Gael, it was Robinson, not Austin Curry, who received the bounce in the opinion polls as voters moved away from Lenin. Fianna Fáil's coalition partners, the Progressive Democrats, threatened to pull out of government unless Lenehan resigned. Hawhey asked Bertie O'Hearn to bring Lenehan to his home, where he would try and convince him to resign for the sake of the government. He wasn't one bit happy, but I think he understood. I mean, Brian was a, a political um, animal, and uh, I think he said, well, OK, if that's what they're going to do, that's what they're going to do. He wasn't offering it. <laughs> he, he wasn't saying that this is, this is the best solution. Hawhey drafted a letter of resignation for Lenehan to sign. Lennon felt it would be tantamount to an admission of guilt, which would make his bid for the presidency unsustainable. Their meeting had to be cut short so Hawhey could welcome Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands on her state visit. At the airport, Hawhey was confronted by a scrum of journalists and questioned about Lennon. Can you offer his resignation, Mr Hawhey? Oh no. <coughs> Nor did I seek it. Nor did I seek it. Any question? Any, I want to make it absolutely clear that anything of that nature is entirely a matter for my old friend, Brian and himself personally. I would not exert any pressure of any kind, nor would any of my colleagues. As James Downey noted, by now, economy of truth had given way to total absence of it. Hawhey had set Lennon a deadline of 5pm for his resignation. Despite Duffy's tape suggesting that Lennon had made the phone calls to President Hillary at Hawhey's request, the Taoiseach was unequivocal. Lennon went back on the campaign trail, retreating into the heartland of his own supporters in Athlone. Hawhey sent Bertie O'Hearn and Porrick Flynn to persuade Lennon to resign. But Mary O'Rourke remembers the boisterous support Lennon received at his rally in the Prince of Wales Hotel. Bertie O'Hearn was clever. He saw the crowd, he heard the shouts. They shouted and roared, um, no resignation, no resignation, and don't lie down, and all this kind of stuff. And Bertie hijacked it out of the Prince of Wales as quick as his legs would take him and got back to Dublin. Flynn stayed shouting and all. Well, anyway. I used bad language and I said, go over the Shannon with a few Fs in it and never, we don't want to see you again. We would prefer a general election to Brian Lennon resigning. We are Fianna Fáil. We stick by Brian Lennon. Lennon confirmed that he would not go quietly. With the government confidence vote the next day, the issue was simple for Hawhey. Zach Lennon or face a general election. This evening I requested the Tarnishta, Mr Brian Lennon TD, to resign as a member of the government 
and that he failed to comply with this request. Accordingly, I propose to exercise my constitutional prerogative to advise the President to terminate his appointment as a member of the government. Brian Lenehan has been a friend, a loyal and trusted colleague for well over a quarter of a century. What I have to do, I do with great sadness and great sorrow. Lenin's dismissal was enough of an appeasement for the Progressive Democrats, and Hawhey's government won its conference vote. However, as Bride Rosney and John Waters explain, Lenin's sacking from government actually turned out to be good news for his presidential campaign. Suddenly, Lenin was seen as the victim of the whole affair. That was the worst moment in the Robinson campaign, because that brought back that entire flood of affection. In that it created this surge. I remember going round in the bus with Lenin in Cork. People were crying and coming up to him and kissing him and everything like that. And that was not the usual kind of bonhomie that you get in relation to politics. It was a deep-seated affection, which has to do with his own personality and the fact of his sickness. The fact that he'd been ill, people, and the, he had the look of being ill, you know, very thin, very like emaciated. You know, it was like your father. People wanted to embrace him as their father. In the space of little over a week, the campaign had been turned on its head, with the pendulum of support swinging wildly in both directions. Manny felt the election had come to represent much more than just the presidency. Brian Lennon had gone from being seen as the heir apparent to public enemy number one to the scapegoat paying for all the sins of Fianna Fáil, past and present. Mary Robinson had gone from a liberal outsider to being seen as a new hope who represented a more honest style of politics. Austin Curry's candidacy had almost become an afterthought. Heading into the final weekend of the campaign, the stage appeared set for a remarkable Lennon comeback. But there was still to be one more twist in the campaign when Fianna Fáil's Porrick Flynn went on RTE Radio's Saturday View programme. Going on the offensive, he launched an ill-judged attack on Robinson, forgetting the old aphorism of Sean Lamas, that mud thrown was ground lost. She was pretty well constructed for this uh, campaign uh, by her handlers, the Labour Party and the Workers' Party. Of course, it doesn't always suit if you get labelled a socialist because that's a very narrow focus in this country. So she has to try and have it both ways. She has her new clothes and her new look and her new hairdo and she has the new interest in family, being a mother and all that kind of thing. But none of us, you know, none of us who knew Mary Robinson very well uh, in previous incarnations ever heard her claiming to be well, well, the great wife and mother. Can I interrupt the minister? Just a second, just a second, just a second Michael. Now, wait a moment. Mary Robinson reconstructs herself to fit the fashion of the time. That's so As Lennon's sister Mary O'Rourke explains, Flynn's tirade especially alienated female voters. Porrick Flynn was taken as old-style Fianna Fáil, uncouth kind of language, you know. Oh, a newfound interest in her hair and her clothes. It was an awful thing to say. And her family. I mean, she was always a very good family woman. But people took that as indicative of what Fianna Fáil were thinking, do you know what I mean? When it wasn't really. There were loads of women, of all parties, uh, very annoyed at uh, that kind of language. Fergus Finley, Labour's advisor on the Robinson campaign, and Bertie Ahern, Lennon's campaign manager, both agree that Flynn's outburst had a dramatic impact on the way people voted just a few days later. P. Flynn had single-handedly destroyed the, the recovery that was beginning to take place in the Lennon campaign. It, it is my view that Brian Lennon would have won the election and with the momentum was massively with us um, uh, and Brian Lennon would have won the election except for that interview. On polling day November 7th, despite Duffy's tape and Flynn's radio outburst, Brian Lennon still managed to secure 44% of the vote to Mary Robinson's 39%. However, 77% of those who voted for Austin Curry gave their second preference vote transfer to Mary Robinson giving her victory over Lennon by 5.6% and seeing her elected as Ireland's first ever female president. I was elected by men and women of all parties and none, by many with great moral courage who stepped out from the faded flags of the Civil War and voted for a new Ireland. As historian Michael Laffin and Robinson's campaign manager Bride Rosney explain, Mary Robinson's election was a hugely symbolic moment in Irish life and culture. Robinson's victory was a great breakthrough. Uh, she, she represented something new. She was relatively young. She was dynamic. Uh, she was a total contrast to all the presidents who had gone before her. And people felt this is possibly the beginning of a new Ireland, particularly for women. It was very formative in women's political education because I remember early on asking people, will you give Mary your number one, one vote? I'll have to check at home, you know. 
They'd ask their father or their husband what way they'd vote. And that was common enough. But the secrecy of the ballot box and the confidence that women got at that stage was extraordinary. And we knew it, which is why in Mary's acceptance speech, she laid such emphasis on the women of Ireland, Manona Heron. The women of Ireland, Manona Heron, who instead of rocking the cradle, rocked the system. <laughs> Brian Lennon always maintained that he did not call Iris and Nuke Drawn in 1982. He also claimed that the Duffy tape scandal had been an orchestrated trap set by Fine Gael. After the election, Fine Gael's Jim Mitchell, who had been Curry's campaign manager, even seemed to admit that it had been. However, Jim Duffy denies this. Both Alan Jukes and Austin Curry state that they had no responsibility for it. Jim Mitchell may well have known uh, about some of the contents of the tape. Um, I don't know. The man has passed away, unfortunately. It appeared to some people uh, that it, it was uh, uh, a stratagem by, by Fine Gael. Uh, that the allegation was that it was a trap. Uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't involved in it. In it anyway. Lennon's campaign manager, Bertie Ahern, is convinced that Fine Gael had prior knowledge of Duffy's tape before the discussion on questions and answers. They clearly knew about it, um, and uh, Jim Mitchell had been polled that night to let Garrett in, and, and, and you know, because then that, you see, linked it to the events of the election, uh, the government collapsing, and all of that. Um, uh, that was it, it was all well set up and the Irish Times were obviously well tipped off and the whole thing was, uh, was, was planned by, by Fine Gael and by Duffy. Professor Michael Laffin believes that despite Duffy's tape setting in motion what many people viewed as a positive outcome for the country, Duffy should not have made public his research interview with Lennon. It was unethical that Jim Duffy should not have done it, that uh, a conversation, an interview for uh, scholarly purposes if you like, for the record, should not have been used uh, to damage the, the, the reputation, the career of the man who gave it. Brian Lenehan, I think, gave that interview in good faith, thinking that uh, it was for a scholarly purpose, that it would not be used in public, that he could afford an indiscretion of some sort. He could afford a contradiction. And he was, he felt deceived, and to an extent, rightly so. Jim Duffy told me uh, that he uh, had been almost threatened by Fianna Fáil figures. I've no idea whether that's true or not. And that in order to protect his own reputation, he had to go public. I, I disapproved of what Jim Duffy did, but I was very glad that the election turned out as it did and that Mary Robinson was elected. I was sorry for Brian Lenehan, but happy for the country that uh, there was this change. It was a symbolic shift to a new, and I hoped, and many people hoped, more liberal Ireland. Robinson's presidency is seen as having a profound legacy, and she is credited with rejuvenating interest in the office. Brian Lennon's health deteriorated, and he passed away in 1995, aged 64. His son, Brian Lennon Jr., was subsequently elected to his seat in Dublin West. Jim Duffy graduated with first-class honours and went on to work as a journalist, as well as for the Fine Gael Party. In 1997, President Hillary donated his private papers to the UCD archives. They contain the phone log from Iris and Uchtron on the night of January 27, 1982. They show that seven phone calls were made by representatives of Fianna Fáil, including three by Brian Lennon. <laughs>